Okay, please be seated. You probably think I'm going to ad lib this thing, you know? Okay, that'll be fun. I do want to say before I start that if there is anyone here who is Italian, and uh, don't be offended in that I will mispronounce every single Italian name. But that, I, just to be fair, I'm going to mispronounce every English word. So uh, that that's just covers the basis uh, on that. Um, this is not my first lecture ever. Uh, some people say it might be my last, but uh, OK. So I'm going to launch. And that means uh, I'm going to start talking with a Boston accent. And uh, you won't understand me. So the, the, the big challenge here is who goes to sleep first, the audience or the speaker? And it's, it's always a question who, which, in my case, which one it is. So, OK, let's do it. OK. Fool me once, shame on thee. Fool me twice, shame on me. Modernity is a twofold trick. The first trick Machiavelli almost openly reveals in the comedy The Mandragula. He warns us against trickery at the beginning of the play. A young woman, a shrewd one, was much loved by him and by him was tricked, as you will hear. And I would wish that you might be tricked as she was. Now you'll have to see what the trick was. Let us begin with the surface of the comedy, because you probably aren't familiar with it. Calemico, okay, first mispronunciation. An Italian, who, and it's not Italian, it's Greek. An Italian who has lived in France to avoid the Italian wars returns to Italy to seduce a married woman, Lucrezia Calfucci, reputed for her great beauty and, of course, chastity. All Italian women are chaste. To achieve his desire, he enlists the aid of Lugerio, a schemer, who assembles a conspiracy so that Calemico can succeed. The husband, meant to be cockled, Nisia Calfucci, is enlisted in the conspiracy. He wants children, and he supposes that his wife has difficulty bearing children. She too, we hear, desires to have children. Nisia's apparent great stupidity seems to make the play a comedy. A complicated scheme is devised. Calemico is introduced to Nisia as a physician, and he tells Nisia a fantastic story that only a very stupid man would believe. Calemico claims that he has a concoction of the mandrake plant that will cure his wife's sterility. The joke is, is that everyone assumes that it's Nisia who is impotent. Calemico adds that the first man that sleeps with Lucretia after she takes the concoction will die. Thereafter, it is safe at, within eight days. Thereafter, it's safe to sleep with her because the first man draws out the mandrake poisons. Nisia does not want to be that first man, and therefore the conspirators need to seek out a substitute for Nisia to engage in intercourse immediately after Lucretia's consumption of the mandrake potion. It's funny how it doesn't affect her. They determine to find a man in the street and bring him to Lucretia for the rendezvous. Calemico plans to be that man. Harvey Mansfield, so I'm going to cut it short and give you, argues that if Nisia knows that he's impotent, and my guess is this is something you sort of know, uh, 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 or maybe not, maybe it's a secret, and very much wants a child to maintain his family, in this case he too would be in on the joke. He would willingly subject his wife to another man because it's the only way that the family can seem to continue. Because this is long before, you know, all modern science. Stupidity is his disguise. There are signs in the play to support Mansfield's thesis. I would go with it anyway because it makes things fun, but there are signs it's true. I will give one example of the evidence that Nisia is not as stupid as he appears. To entice Lucrezia's confessor, now here I go, I'm going to mispronounce another name, Frate Tumatio, into the plot against her, 
And in fear of Nicias' apparent stupidity, Lugerio has him feign deafness when they first meet the priest. It is a disguise of the moment. Later in the play, when the conspirators are to grab an innocent pedestrian for the liaison with Lucretia, Calamico realizes that he cannot be among the conspirators and be the man kidnapped for the encounter with Lucretia. He's not the brightest one, and we're going to find out. The priest takes his place. Nicia notices that the priest does not sound like Calamico, a fact that he ascribes to Calamico disguising his voice effectively. Yet when they grab Calamico, he stupidly speaks. He says, woe is me, what have I done? Since Machiavelli spends so much time showing that Nicia hears quite well and deafness is a disguise, we suspect that Nicia is not as stupid as he appears. And by recognizing the voice, he realized the kidnapped man is Calamico. Nevertheless, Nicia makes no objection to proceeding with the plan. Machiavelli intends that we be suspicious readers, much like a detective, our minds replicate the conspiracy. Even if Nicia is a trickster, who's being tricked? For we have reason to think that many of the characters believe they are tricksters. Yet if all are tricksters, then nearly all, or perhaps all, are tricked. The most important case, of course, is Lucretia herself. Machiavelli wishes that we all might be tricked like her. On the surface, this means she's tricked into the situation where she can have an adequate lover without sin. If, however, Nicia is impotent, Lucretia might know this. Moreover, her reputation among the conspirators is that she is wise and rules her husband. So how is she tricked? Perhaps the most significant discussion in the play is between Lucretia and her confessor. We wonder whether she believes that there is anything real about the discussion of conscience that she has with him. He reformulates the conscience in terms of prudence. As to the conscience, you have to take the general principle that where there is a certain good and an uncertain evil, one should never leave that good for fear of that evil. <laughs> Here is a certain good that you will become pregnant, that good for fear of that evil. Here is a certain good, okay, that, okay, will acquire a soul for God. The uncertain evil is that the one who will lie with you after you take the potion may die. But those who don't die are also found. But because the thing is doubtful, it is therefore well that Messonicia does not run that risk. Of course, he, he, he changes everything, right? I mean, the death is supposed to be certainty. The calculation is funny because the terms of the conscience become more or less a calculation of the certainty of the consequences. We know that Nicia does not sleep with Lucretia immediately because he purportedly thinks the potion certainly will kill him. But this is the problem with prudence. One can always make a mistake in calculation. The adultery, however, is certain and it breaks a moral law. Frate Tomatio does not argue that it is not an evil, so he must claim that it is not an evil for which Lucretia is responsible. He argues that she is really not responsible for the sin because she is pleasing her husband. I guess something that happens rarely. It is his will that she submit to and risk the life of a stranger. And therefore, it is her husband who must take the responsibility for the action in sin. Not the apprehension and the doing of good and evil, but willing it is the central activity of conscience. The depth of the issues in Lucretia's seduction is revealed when Frate completes his argument with an appeal to the authority of the Bible, which I don't think he quotes directly. Quote, the Bible says that the daughters of Lot, believing themselves alone in the world, lay with their father, and because their intention was good, sin, can't be. They didn't sin. But Lucretia's pri prior response to the scheme rejected this kind of appeal to the righteousness of adultery and murder in order to prevent the disappearance of mankind. But, quote, this is what she says. But of all things that have been attempted, this seems to me the most strange to have to submit my body to this disgrace, to be the cause that a man might die for disgracing me. Because if I were the only woman remaining in the world, 
And if nature had to rise again fr from me, I couldn't believe that such a course would be allowed to me. Lucrezia appears to think that there are invulnerable la uh, laws that forbid her to join in this action. The incest, let's see, I, it's a lecture by me, I can't avoid the subject. The incest of Lot's daughters belongs to the story of Sodom and Gomorrah that follows immediately the visit of the angels to Abraham and the Lord's announcement that Sarah, in her old age, will give birth to Isaac. She laughs. The old giving birth is laughable because imagining the impossible is imagining the laughable. According to the Bible, then, comedy and always includes something that appears to be impossible. I think part of the joke is, of course, it's possible for God. But the Sodom episode opens with Abraham negotiating with the Lord for the preservation of the city if there are as few as ten righteous men in it. Only Lot and his two unmarried daughters, however, are saved. Sodom and Gomorrah burn. When the two angels arrive in Sodom, Lot insistently invites them into his house. The entire male population of Sodom surrounds Lot's house and demands that he bring them out so the men might know them. They then threaten Lot. This is the evil expression of unbridled desire. The Bible has a harsh view of human society. Left to themselves, men regard doing evil as a good. The men of Sodom are attracted to abusing the angels, it seems, in part because they're travelers. Desires are often excited by novel experiences, whether good or evil. These Sodomites are men of unchecked desire. Lot offers his two virgin daughters in place of the angels. In the context of the comedy, of the comedy, not the Bible, this offering is a rebuke to the prudent Sosostra, who is the mother of uh, Lucretia, and Frate to Matia. In the extreme case, like Sodom, it is not the rules of conscience that fail, but rather the calculation of prudence. We cannot justify the substitution of the two young daughters for the angels. What unspeakable horrors does Lot propose that his daughters suffer? Will they be murdered after much sexual abuse? The angels do not permit the substitution and save Lot from the cried crowd by blinding its uh, participants. There is no sense in the Sodom story that the people of Sodom should be replaced. If they are replaced, they are to be replaced by the descendants of Abraham. Frate characterizes the daughters of Lot as believing themselves alone in the world because, I suppose, they assume that the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah is the destruction of the entire world probably what Machiavelli thought too. Since they think themselves alone, they believe that there are no men to serve as their fathers to the children. The older daughter claims that they would be preserving the seed of their father, a claim that might make incest more generally permissible. In fact, if you carry that argument, it seems to me it pre preferable. Since they had good intentions, the frate claims, they committed no sin. But incidentally, uh, they commit incest with a father whom they make drunk for fear that he will condemn their actions. According to the Greek tradition, the incest prohibition is the law of laws. Sophocles reveals that the incest prohibition is the condition for the human family and the morality associated with it. The prohibition creates the generations, and the distinction of generations allows for a moral order. The prohibitive wall against incest causes fathers and mothers to belong to one generation and brothers and sisters to another. Parents do not exploit children sexually, and the older generation allows the younger to develop and become persons in a fuller sense. A parent generates the young, nurtures them, and permits them to establish their independence. Oedipus, however, has two sets of parents, one that generated him and one that nurtured him. The incest prohibition allows the two to be combined in one set. We cannot know the conditions of the earliest humans, even the earliest biblical humans. Certainly in the beginning, the incest prohibition, at least within the generations, was suspended. But by the time of Noah, the crime of Ham reveals that honoring one's father and restricting one's sexual appetites <coughs> are demanded by the Bible. 
from the time of the flood, incest is wrong, and no intention can make it good. Indeed, violating the incest prohibition to repopulate the earth with humans might ensure, according to the Bible, that no more humans can appear on the earth. No more humans, but only sodomites. Given the import of the story of Lot and his daughters, why does Machiavelli have the frate use it in his argument for adultery? You sort of can see, right? Because adultery allows, again, splits up who the parents are. You've got the natural, at least the father, and then you've got the father who brings it up. This is before DNA identification. During the comedy, the purpose of the conspiracy is altered. No longer is there any talk of the imminent departure of Calimico, as there was at the devising of the plot. He was just going to sleep with her once. He becomes part of Nissi's family. He is given a key to the house with the privilege of entrance almost whenever he wishes. The adultery becomes established as the norm of the family. It seems that normalizing uh, of these events in the initial cuckolding benefits everybody, but foremost Lucretia. She attains all the benefits and pleasures of being married to a young man. It is now almost certain that she will attain the child she wishes. Nisia too is more likely to attain his desire to have a child acknowledged publicly to be his son. Calemico appears to be one of those benefited by the institutionalizing of adultery. His enjoyment of his love for Lucretia is extended. He can watch over his children under the guise of godfather. Still, at the opening of the comedy, he is the man of desire. Desire may be momentary. It may be various. Instead, he has placed his future desires under the government of this institutional adultery. Ligario predicts that Lucretia will embrace the continuation of the affair, and in fact, Lucretia readily agrees to implement the new order of the household. We must suspect that this prolonged intercourse was the plan all along. But who suggested it? It was not Colonico. After the initial intercourse with Lucretia, Colonico was not entirely satisfied and he woos her with words that no doubt Lugerio suggested. Quote, I stayed with a troubled mind until three o'clock. Although I took great pleasure in it, it didn't seem good to me. It's just an amazing distinction for a guy like that. But then I made myself known to her and made her understand the love I bore for her and how easily on account of her husband's simplicity we could live happily without any scandal, promising her whenever God did otherwise with him, to take her for my wife. <laughs> and, uh, and besides these true reasons, having tasted what a difference there is between my lying with her and Nicias, and between the kisses of a young lover and those of an old husband, after some size, she said, since your astuteness, my husband's stupidity, my mother's simplicity, my confessor's wickedness have led me to do what I would never have done by myself. I'm determined to judge that this, that it comes from heavenly disposition, which has so willed it. And I don't have it in me to reject what heaven wills me to accept. Therefore, I take you for my Lord, master, and God. Tones of uh, Dante. You are my father, my defender, and I want you to be my every good. And what my husband wanted for one evening, I want him to have always. She has a sense of humor. Lucretia's confession to Calimico shows that she has persuaded, or at least adopts, Timatio's moral reasoning. The belief that the conspiracy is really heaven's will is a variation of Frate's argument. Lucretia does, not, does seem to believe that a perfectly good order can be constructed if she puts her faith in Calimico. Yet now it seems that putting one's faith in Calimico is putting one's faith in stupidity. Putting faith in stupidity seems to be the most significant trick of Machiavellian liberalism. Lucretia avers that since the conspiracy brings together astuteness, simplicity, stupidity, wickedness to achieve an apparent good, it must be the will of heaven and not her will. Although Calemico mentions God, who seems to be a destroyer, she only mentions heaven. Heaven weaves good 
out of vices. In the new sexual arrangement, Lucretia claims that she will that she that she will give up her will to the new divinity, Calimico. She regards herself as responsible for nothing because she ceases to be a being who can be responsible for her own morality. He is her conscience, and she remains innocent. Still, when we recall that according to the Bible, comedy depends upon an impossibility, we must ask whether Lucretia's construction of the new order of her family is impossible. Can credulity suffice to institute a new order containing humans motivated by complex desires? Is she innocent merely because she thinks she's innocent? Yet, although institutionalized adultery might be a contradiction in terms, Lucretia's commitment to Calimico is only an exaggeration of the commitment that Frate presumes that Lucretia, as a Christian, makes to her husband. If we follow Tomatio's teaching, then Christian marriage expects the wife to accept her husband as master. He has the will, she doesn't. The conspiracy is formed, okay, so now I'm going to refer to the prince, try to connect it to, in the manner that chapter 25 of the prince suggests. In the infamous ending to chapter 25 of the prince, Machiavelli recommends to the young men of Italy that they treat the, the fortune as a woman who must be ruled with force, as the Roman Lucretia was. The fundamental concern, however, of the chapter, it seems to me, is the preservation of free will. Chapter 25 begins, now I should have put it on a little thing up there, but it is not unknown to me, this is Machiavelli, that many have held and hold the opinion that worldly things are so governed by fortune and by God that men cannot correct them with their prudence. Indeed, that they have no remedy at all. And on account of this, they might judge that one need not sweat much over things, but let oneself be governed by chance. When I have thought about this sometimes, I have been in some part inclined to their opinion. Nonetheless, so that our free will not, will not be eliminated, I judge that it might be true that fortune is arbitrator of half our actions, but also that she leaves the other half or close to it for us to govern. Machiavelli presents his project as preserving the opinion that there is free will, and what is not unknown is the opinion of other men. He does not argue that free will is real, but only that it is a matter of opinion. It might be true that half our actions are left to us to govern. He indicates two related opinions that he claims are destructive of free will. One of them, Lucretia espouses in the Mandragula. Machiavelli thinks that both beliefs that worldly things are governed by fortune and by God that men that cannot correct them with their prudence are destructive of free will. In this respect, Machiavelli considers chance and predestined providence equivalent. The conspiracy, because it brought together contrary attributes, most of which are bad, Lucretia avows was irresistible and must be the work of heaven. The lack of free will means that those persons lacking it cannot be blamed for their actions. They do not sin and the distinction between adultery and marriage disappears. Those who commit apparent wrongs because they are deceived are not wicked. They are stupid, and stupidity is not a sin. Those who believe most people can be sinners must also judge it true that fortune leaves at least some of our actions for us to govern. Machiavelli wants it both ways. He wants there to be free will, but he also wants an argument that allows those who will to escape blame for their willing, Lucretia argues that she's not responsible for adultery because the conspiracy was large and the elements making it were so various. Lucretia wills the outcome of the conspiracy but avoids responsibility. In chapter 25, Machiavelli does, does not specify how much fortune governs our actions. He says it might be half, but what if it's 90%? Do we consider our responsibility diminishing accordingly? Yet the conspiracy does not work if everyone does not try to will it in some way. No one, however, attains all they want. Lucretia, for example, does not really select her lover, even if she implements the adultery through the actions of her husband. If our suspicions are right, 
she substitutes a stupid, if virile, lover for an astute, if impotent, husband. Modernity, and maybe that's the way things naturally go together. Modernity picks up the instruments that Machiavelli fashions in, in chapter 25 and uses it in many contexts. Consider how the invisible hand of the market works. We enter the market according to our own will, but we accept the verdict of the compounded wills for the price of what we desire. Perhaps the best example of this Machiavellian instrument is given in Federalist 10, where Madison speaks of the control of factions, which are, natural, which are a natural result of freedom. But they're controlled by multiplicity. The more factions th there are, the less the result fulfills the will of any particular faction. Moreover, they forestall the kind of behavior that the Bible reports in Sodom. The mob does not rule because there are other factions, there are other mobs. The wills combine to compose a will that belongs to no individual faction. To recall, chapter 25 of The Prince ends with the advice that the young men treat fortune like a woman who can be forced. But how much better is it to treat women as though they can be tricked? Like the vast majority of people, the young are credulous. It is our desires and fears that make us credulous. The mandragula seems to be a sort of commentary on chapter 25. If the youth approach fortune impetuously in the frenzy of desire, they're likely to be deceived. Fortune is pictured in the form of a woman to control the actions of others. There is no argument for free will. When Machiavelli presumes there's free will is because he wants there to be free will. But how many humans in truth have free will? If few have it to a large degree and many are stupid and uncontrollably desirous, Machiavelli implies that under these circumstances, Fortune may be conquered by someone astute. Like Calemico, the young who attack fortune as though it were a woman are the means for the conquest of fortune. The Mandragula prepares Machiavelli's audience to be his tools for the conquest of fortune. Like Calemico, they think they're so smart and they are fooled by Nicia, Lucrezia, and Machiavelli. They must, ha however, have the faith that the order of the fools will provide the best results. Machiavelli cel celebrates the good fortune that all the goods, all the world are fools. The loosening of humans from moral conscience and the emphasis on free will allows them to be willing implements of new modes and orders. The fools, like Lucrezia, have a new faith that the economic, political, and social processes implement a greater will that all can rely on. The conquest of fortune is in truth a disguise for Machiavellian conquest of humanity. This is the first trick. The second trick. All's well, it ends well. So that, that's the optimistic part of the, of the lecture. Okay. Okay, the Mandragula reveals that the structure of a Machiavellian conspiracy is that it entangles those against whom he conspires. Calemico, who claims to be a, the astute leader of the conspiracy to sedu seduce Lucretia, is the dupe of the Mandragula's conspiracy. Likewise, the conspiracy against fortune developed in chapter 25 of the Prince draws in the victims of the real Machiavellian conspiracy by encouraging their desires to control a female fortune. Machiavelli works with the fact that all the world are fools, since all desire something that blinds them. Machiavelli deceives his readers about the objects of his conspiracy. In The Prince, force is oversold and fraud underestimated. He deceives his readers about the power of deception by deceiving them about who is deceived. One thinks it's only the good who are deceived, but it is the desirous who are duped. In Shakespeare's All's Well That Ends Well, a French woman, <laughs> you know, these, 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 these seduction things do not take place in England. <laughs> a, French, a French woman, uh, we, we could explain that. I think we will explain that in the question period. Um, <laughs> travels to Italy to trick her husband, Bertram, Count of Rossillon, who is fighting in the Italian wars, into consummating their marriage. Bertram seems personally unattractive. His unattractiveness seems to besmirch the heroine who pursues him. Helena loves him, 
compels him to marry her, and then deceives him into conceiving a child with her. The audience rightly asks, what does she see in him? Yet, I think what she sees in him is the key to the character of modernity in the modernity in which we live. He is, in fact, the modern Machiavellian male. Although the plot of All's Well is the inverse of the Mandragora, since the woman tricks the man, there is no direct evidence in the scholarship, anyway, that Shakespeare reflects on the Mandragora. Scholars trace the plot to Boccaccio, but the clown Lavetch, so there's a clown, it's a comedy, in one of his exchanges with the countess, who is the mother of Bertrand, recapitulates facetiously the plot of the Mandragora. So here we get the entire plot of the Mandragora. Here it goes. You are shallow, madam, in great friends, for the knaves come to do for me, which I am weary of. He that ears my land spears my team and gives me leave to end the crop. If I be a cockle, he's my drudge. He that comforts my wife is a cherisher of my flesh and blood. He that cherishes my flesh and blood loves my flesh and blood. He that loves my flesh and blood is my friend. Ergo, he that kisses my wife is my friend. <laughs> I mean, he, he, the, the fool's not, not stupid. <laughs> Nonetheless, the deception by Helena of her husband seems simpler than the conspiracy of the Mandragora. It also seems less comic. It doesn't seem as funny. The Mandragora is really funny. I mean, Helena opens, openly uses the coercive power of the king to achieve her end, and I think that's what det detracts. There's much more coercion here. Apart from the clown's mockery, is there anything deeply Machiavellian about all's well? To determine the answer, let us consider to what extent Helena reasons like a Machiavellian. Her most apparently Machiavellian statement about fortune occurs when reflecting to herself, she decides to venture to Paris in order to cure the king of his terminal disease. She seems confident that she can overcome her fortune. And this is, a, the, I think, the only famous speech from this comedy. Our remedies oft in ourselves do lie, which we ascribe to heaven. The faded sky gives free scope, only doth backward pull. Our slow designs when we ourselves are dull, what power is it which mounts my love so high that makes me see and cannot feed mine eye? The mightiest space in fortune's nature brings to join like likes and miss like native things. Impossible be strange attempts to those that weigh their pains and sense and do suppose what hath been cannot be. Whoever strove to show her merit that did miss her love, the king's disease. My project may deceive me, but my intents are fixed and will not leave me. Later, she gives more credit to the influence of the heavens, but when she does so, she's always in public. Indeed, the report about her private plaints against fortune overheard by the steward and repeated to the countess, who's the mother of Bertrand, the count that she's after, probably are meant to be overheard and designed to move the countess, who it seems had a youthful love she lost. She doesn't seem much enamored with her dead husband. Helena's plot is perfect in reaching the king to cure him, incurring him to ask a boon from him. But here she seems much less a Machiavellian and more a desirous stumbler, for she requests from the king that she be able to marry any of the nobles that she desires, and she desires Bertrand, rather than bring him to assent to, the, to marry her or to trick him into marrying her willingly, she coerces him into the marriage. The modern Bacon, Baconian medical science, which cures the king and obviously benefits the powerful, seems to transform the Machiavellian project into Helena's project of tyranny. Medical science subverts Machiavelli's hope that free will can find support in the opinions of free modern humans. The medical preservation of life seems to work against free will, you must wear a mask, yet Helena seems to miscalculate the effect of coercion on Bertrand. Bertrand at first refuses to obey the king and rejects Helena. Once he capitulates to the king's threats and marries her, he steals away. Before choosing Bertrand, Helena interviews and herself rejects four other lords. They're all willing to accept her. We asked why Helena would love Bertrand, who is so disagreeable, and rejects her. 
Her love is not rational from the perspective of the object, but from the perspective of the process of love. He's hard to get. We might think the hard to get is much overrated, but not if we reason like Machiavelli and Helena. Bertram is willful. He's willing to defy the king of France. He's exactly the kind of person that would overcome fortune if she were a woman. His foolishness is connected to his willful belief that he ought to be free. And thus he runs off to the wars of Florence, Italy, and the home of Machiavelli. Does Shakespeare venture to show us the inversion of the Machiavellian image? Supposing fortune is a man, what then? It's bad. The comedy starts again with the action in Italy and Helena's second scheme that involves a complicated deception of Bertram. Even for the second scheme, Helena has been preparing herself from the beginning of the comedy. Her entrance into the first scene involves a natural, this is a quote, natural deception. The Countess believes Helena may be affecting sorrow for her dead father, when in fact she is sorrowful because Bertrand is leaving for Paris. So she isn't sorrowful for her dead <coughs> father, this is the way it always works, but for her boyfriend leaving town. Immediately thereafter, she has a conversation with Paroles, whose name means words in French, purportedly about how to defend the fortress of virginity against the besieging of males. The imagery throughout is military. Paroles claims that the defense against the male besieger is not possible, but he suggests the victory of the male is a kind of suicide, specifically that lusting after women can be used as a trap contrived to destroy men. Paroles lewdly explains, this is a quote from him, it's not me, virginity being blown down, man will quickly be blown up. Everyone in the comedy thinks that Paroles is a corrupter of Bertrand. We might think that the body imagery of the conversation between Paroles and Helena is solely the fault of Paroles. Helena, however, asks a most revealing question about virginity. Quote, how might one do, sir, to lose it to her own liking? She learns that virginity is a commodity and that it might be sold, as it were, to to the man of one's own liking. The imagery of uh, a female as a fortress against the invasion of the male is the trope, is a trope that Machiavelli also uses. On the whole, Machiavelli advises would-be princes against fortresses. One of the few women he mentions in the prince is Madonna Catarona, Countess of Forli, I mispronounced all those names, once used once used a fortress to escape the enemy after the murder of her first husband. It did not, however, protect her a second time against Chagery Borgia. The incident of her first use of a fortress is one of the most shocking episodes in Machiavelli's discourse on living. Now, I'm quoting Machiavelli. This is not me. <laughs> this is a great book, okay? Some for forly conspirators killed Count the Count their lord, and took his wife and his children, who were small. Since it appeared to them that they could not live secure if they did not become masters of the fortress, and the Castilian was not willing to give it to them, Madonna Catharina, so the countess was called, promised the conspirators that if they let her enter, she would deliver it to them. Under this faith, they let her enter it, and as soon as she was inside, she reproved them from the walls for the death of her husband and threatened them with every kind of revenge. And to show that she did not care for her children, she showed them her genitals, saying that she still had the mode for making more of them. So, short of counsel and late to perceive their error, they suffered the penalty of their lack of prudence with perpetual exile. Machiavelli does not repeat the account of the dramatic exposure when he recounts the same incident in the Florentine histories. But I ask you, a man like Machiavelli, do you pay attention to what he, what he says often or only once? There he goes on to say in the Florentine histories that she avenged her husband's death with every kind of cruelty. Nor does he say that the revenge was for the second husband, so one can always get his husband. And among the cruelties, there were murders of the conspirators' wives and children. 
How are you to understand the exposure at the fortress? It is shocking, but ought it be more shocking than the murder of the wives and children of the conspirators? Katerina is not going to allow herself in this episode to be a prisoner of fortune. Indeed, she takes the place of fortune and proclaims she is able to produce a new future for herself. Loss of children would seem to be more important than the loss of chastity, or chastity's most protected possession, virginity. Chastity can be a trap. Katerina will not let it trap her. It is not a fortress meant to imprison her. Indeed, it, is off, it often can be used, as Farol shows in the imagery, to trap the male besieging it. And this entrapment is exactly what happens to Bertrand when he besieges the virginity of an Italian woman, Diana, but finds in her place, unbeknownst to himself, his wife, Helena. He is trapped, really, by the oldest trick in the book that begins with Jacob, Leah, and Rachel. After Bertrand abandons Helena, he sets for her two challenges that he thinks are impossible to meet. Okay, when thou canst get the ring upon my finger, which sh never shall come off, show me a child begotten of thy body that I am father to, then call me husband. But in such a then, I write a never. Why does he add these cruel challenges to his flight? There is some evidence that this letter was written under the influence of paroles. Still, these, impossible, these apparent impossible conditions allow for the possibility that Helena can capture Bertrand again. It also represents, or will represent, the destruction of male power and the rise of what appears to be female power. Bertrand's ring was passed down from generation to generation of the males in the Count's family. It is a sign of fatherly power and filial piety. It is the token of the aristocratic father's authority. We saw in the Mandragla that the conspirators weaken the family, but they're able to do so without destroying the reputation of the family. In All's Well, the Countess plays with the notion that she is really mother to Helena. Helena resists the Countess's suggestion because she does not wish the incest prohibition of invoked against her marriage to Bertrand. The Countess then claims she was only intending the title of mother-in-law. In society, all fathers, at least, are in some sense only fathers-in-law. The law against incest makes the father what he's regarded to be in the conventional family. A man secures his fatherly position in part by what he will not do. In all, the father preserves the non-incestuous family. At the beginning of the comedy, the family has already been weakened. The fathers of Bertrand and Helena are dead. The king's affliction seems to make him appear like a pregnant woman. Part of the paradox of Bertrand's situation is that by asserting his freedom to choose his wife, and since Helena is forced on him as a wife, to abandon his family, he weakens the patriarchal family and thereby weakens male virtue. At the beginning of the comedy, Bertrand accords honor to his father. He at least espouses a kind of filial piety. Yet he loses his father's ring that has been passed down in the family. With the loss of the paternal ring, filial piety is lost in the comedy. Helena, for example, admits she forgot her father, who was responsible for her art of medicine, and she never mentions a mother, except a would-be mother-in-law, the countess, the same woman who seems to lament being the natural mother to Bertrand. Filial piety is the consequence of the incest prohibition, since the prohibition results in the moral distinction between the generations. In turn, the destruction of filial piety weakens the incest prohibition. In the biblical order, the parents are honored because they are between God and child, between God and the, and the human. They can be a go-between because, they, because the generated are protected from generating with their generators. Cause and effects are not mixed up. Bertrand rejects Helena apparently because she's low born. The king makes two replies. First, he argues that virtue is what should be honored and not the rank of birth. Then he asserts, honors thrive when rather from our acts we them derive than our foregoers. The mere words a slave be boshed on every tomb, sorry, and on every grave a lying trophy, and often is dumb where dust and damned oblivion is the tomb of honored bones indeed. 
And yet, in contradiction, he claims that honor, in fact, is not necessarily earned. In us, meaning the king, he says, to plant thine honor where we please to have it grow. In an aristocratic society, and perhaps in most societies that are not tyrannical, the father is a go-between the family and the government. The family honors its own according to its own measures. Here, there is no go-between the, fa between the father and the state. The king plays the role of father. He s assigns all honors. In the absence of the father, All's Well has many people serving as go-betweens. The most obvious is Paroles, who advises Bertrand and approaches the women he wishes to seduce. So he goes to Italy and fights wars, but he also tries to seduce women, Bertrand. The king is a go-between in the marriage between Bertrand and Helena. The most important go-between is a woman called Diana. She serves as a go-between in the sexual liaison between Bertrand and Helena. And she serves as the one going between Helena and the king and Bertrand in testifying about the conservation, conservation, consummation of the marriage between Helena and Bertrand and the legitimacy of the prospective child. It is on Diana's word that Helena demonstrates that she has fulfilled the two requirements of Bertrand's challenge to her. Most of Act Four, scenes one and two, involve a conspiracy to reveal the true character of paroles to Bertrand. It also exposes, in general, the true character of a go-between. To accomplish these purposes, the conspiracies must make paroles speak the truth, or at least to speak as a coward truly speaks. The plot is to deceive paroles into believing that he has been captured by the enemy. So that the conspirators have to hide their identities. So they speak gibberish to one another. And they depend upon an interpreter to explain paroles in those many languages as you expect words to do, to explain to paroles the purported meaning of the gibberish. The interpreter is the go-between. Although he does not know the meaning of the gibberish, since it really doesn't mean anything, he knows the intention or the meaning of the conspiracy and interprets the gibberish in accordance to that intention. Bertrand arrives to watch the interrogation of paroles. He expects to see Parole's responses. In his responses, a dialogue between the fool and the soldier. A deceiving go-between acts as an interpreter of the meaning between the parties of the conversation. He also engages in a dialogue between how the one for whom he advocates wishes to appear and what he or she wishes to accomplish. This double meaning is the usual character of rhetorical language. And the deception can be itself be doubled since the deceiver is often self-deceived, and the go-between may see this self-deception. The go-between partakes both in the deception of the deceiver and the deception of the victim of the intended deception. Hence, the go-between deceives both parties of the verbal plot. If, however, we are all vain fools, who usually converse to our advantage, then speech itself, entrenched paroles, is always the go-between in a plot intending the deception of those who speak and self-deception of ourselves. The mandra in the Mandragula, we do not accept the speech of any of the characters on its face, and Parole seems unable to speak the truth about anyone. When the interpreter asks the blindfolded captive about his friends, including Virgin, he can only speak badly about them. In the words of this Machiavellian fool, all men are either knaves or fools. If we believe the testimony of paroles, there is a problem with the other major go-between, Diana. Now, she's the one who testifies to the fact that uh, she didn't sleep with uh, Bertram, but uh, Helena did. During his cross-examination by the disguised French lords, they find in his pocket the following letter addressed to her. Now, this is what he says to her. When he swears, Bertram, swears oaths, bid him drop gold and take it. And after he scores, he never pays the score. Half one is match well made, match and well make it. For count of this, the count's a fool. I know it, who pays before, but not when he does owe it. Paroles thinks that Diana is actually in negotiation with Bertram, and that she might be willing to bargain away her virginity. He advises her to be paid before engaging with the count. To reiterate, 
For Rawls is a man of low character who seems to have bad opinions about everybody. Nevertheless, his, his advice, if to a woman of easy virtue, is good. The Count is, of course, a fool and a knave. And he pays advance in advance, but he does not pay afterwards. Moreover, Paroles might have some insights, insight into Diana and her mother. They seem to be grasping. They are paid three times in the course of the play, twice by Helena for this conspiracy, and once by the king. Paroles seems to think that Diana might lie with him, since he writes to her that men are to mell with, boys are not to kiss. So drum, drop Bertrand and go to the main. Diana highlights the ambiguity of the word honest. In soliloquy, Diana admits that she's deceiving Bertram, but she justifies it because he is a deceiver. Nonetheless, she is not honest. There is no honest deception, if, even if by means of deception a truth is deceptively told. We have only the report that Diana is a virgin, and this claim is supported by her name taken from a virgin goddess. She is never put to the proof in the comedy. Now, how that would be done, I don't know. And it is Helena who, by sleeping with Bertram, provides the evidence for Diana's virginity, i.e., I didn't sleep with him, she did, so I'm a virgin. If we accept that Diana is a virgin, her virginity stands in for the virtue of chastity. We see in her no evidence of real chastity and a lot of evidence of her excellence at bargaining. She may be an honest maiden sexually, but she is not an honest maiden verbally. She admits to the audience that she cousins or dupes Bertram. Let us back up before we consider the final act of the comedy. On the one hand, Bertrand turns out to be, by all reports, a man who's courageous and an effective warrior. And in fact, the Florentine Duke chooses Bertrand to be the commander of his cavalry. If all of this is true, then he seems to be to fit many of the qualities of Machiavellian vertu. He is not merely willful. He is, however, a deceiver of women and an outright, if inept, liar. On the other hand, the clever and artful Helena is a deceiver and a liar, and her great deception of Bertrand involves deceptions of many people. For instance, she pretends to be making a, a pilgrimage to the shrine of Saint Jacques Le Grand, when in fact she travels to Florence pursuing Bertrand. She writes letters, I assume, to the consuls, detailing her pilgrimage. It is reported that the rector of the shrine confirmed her death. Either the rector was bribed, or the letter is a forgery of Hel Helenus. These are impositions on society in general, and employed to deceive Bertrand. So this brings me to Act 5, which I am going to read as though it is a conspiracy in which all the major characters conspire against Bertrand. I cannot exactly prove this, because no one says, oh, this is a conspiracy. But there are indications of the conspiracy. First, there is the ring that Bertrand uses as a token in the court for the new engagement to the Lord Lefeu's daughter. The king claims that it is the ring he gave Helena as a signet to invoke his aid. Bertrand thinks that Helena gave it to him, in, no, sorry, Bertrand thinks that Diana gave it to him in bed until Helena testifies that it is she who bestowed the ring upon him. The ring is never mentioned before Act 4. Bertrand truly never saw the ring upon Helena, yet the king, the countess, and Le Feu maintain they saw the ring upon her finger. Now, the king could have given it to Helena during the private audience he had in Act 2. The, king, the countess might have spied it in the short time Helena spent at her residence before Helena chases after Bertrand but the Fuhrer could never have seen it. Significantly, the king's ring replaces in importance Bertrand's ring that he set up as the challenge to Helena to obtain. It is the king's ring that identifies Helena and verifies her story. The other indication of a conspiracy is the messenger that Helena uses to communicate with the king. Helena meets a gentleman at Marseille from which the king has just departed and asks him to give this paper to the king. Helena expects her letter to arrive before she and Diana do. This letter is clearly from Helena to the king. Yet the letter delivered at court, so there's a letter delivered at court, comes late and is from Diana. The king, it seems, was informed that Helena was alive before the scene at the court. In my view, then, Act 5 is a deception in which the players all have a part and the chief player is the king. The dupe of the courtly drama is Bertrand. 
Act five is devoted almost entirely to exposing the lies of Bertrand. Like the exposure of Parole's earlier, the witnesses against Bertrand, Diana and Parole's, seem to talk gibberish. The gibberish is in English, but it seems to be without meaning. So the, the, the lecture is actually copied after, after these. So the two witnesses who also served as go-betweens show how Bertrand's knavery and tomfoolery transformed speech into gibberish. First, the knavery of Bertrand is testified by paroles. So, Diana. Diana speaks. Do you know he promised me marriage? Paroles. Faith, I know more than I'll speak. But wilt thou not speak all thou knoweth? Yes. So, please, your majesty. I did uh, go between them, as I said. But more than that, he loved her. For indeed, he was mad for her and talked of Satan and of limbo and of furies and I know not what. Yet, I was in credit with them at the time that I knew of their going to bed and of their motions as promising her marriage and things which would derive me ill will to speak of. Therefore, I will not speak of them. Thou hast spoken of them already. How to interpret this speech? Does he speak what he knows or what he does not know? Paroles proceeds to spill out what he thinks he knows. Bertrand loves Diana. He slept with her, and he promised to marry her. But he ends by claiming that he will not speak what he knows. This assertion turns out to be true. If we accept the word of the women, Bertrand did not sleep with Diana, and his promise to marry her was made in private. At most, it is hearsay. It is also contrary to Diana's interest to bring him forward, since he testifies that he slept with her against her later claims. Parole seems to be part of a design intended to destroy Bertrand's capacity to resist the conspiracy against him. I think it's actually his capacity to even know anything. Bertrand is a knave. All other attributes, whether they be courage or battlefield acumen, pale in comparison to his evil regard for other human beings, especially women. Bertrand is no different from Parole's, whom Bertrand castigates as the most perfidious slave. Now Paroles is believed above Bertrand. Paroles' speech, however, is a proper preface of Diana's. Earlier, she says to Bertrand, send me, send for your ring, I will return it home and give me mine again. King, what ring was yours, I pray? Sir, much like the same upon your finger. Know you this ring? This ring was his of late? And this was it I gave him, being a bed. The story then goes false. You threw it him out of the case, out of the casement, which is what Bertrand says. Diana, I have spoke the truth. Okay, so there she is. She's, but after Paroles testifies, she has quite a different exchange with the king. King, this ring you say was yours. Aye, my good lord. Where did you buy it, or who gave it to you? It was not given to me, nor did I buy it. Who lent it to you? It was not lent me, neither. Where did you find it? I have found it not. If it were yours by none of these ways, how could you give it to him? I never gave it to him. She explains her gibberish according to the following interpretation. King, wherefore hast thou accused him all this while? Because he's, Diana, because he's guilty and he is not guilty. He knows I am no maid and he'll swear to it. I swear I am a maid and he knows it not. Diana gives two interpretations of the exchange with Bertrand. One from his view and one from hers. In this view, he slept with her and gave her the king's ring. And in her view, he slept with his wife, Helena, and she probably gave Bertrand the king's ring. In the society of deception, speech does not cross from one person to another meaningfully. Speech is no longer an honest go-between. It loses its common meaning. One might assert there is a true story, Diana's, and a false one, Bertrand's. The conspirators can always say the truth. Bertrand turns out to be a fool. What he thought he knew, he did not. Because he is not a partner in the conspiracy, he lives in a world that is illusory. He does not have free will. Rather, he has been tricked into thinking that he is free to act according to his will. He has been forced into a marriage whose consummation he believes he escaped by his will. In truth, he consummated a marriage of which he did not wish to be part. He did not commit adultery. He could not even <coughs> will to sin. His intentions and actions never meet. The Machiavellian man of chapter 25 
in the prince does not conquer fortune. He's incapable of will. He's always a knave and a fool. Okay, I'm going to conclude. Are you going to stay? Okay, I'll conclude. Following the mandracula, we can say that from its origin, modernity is dedicated to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Under the conditions of the new science, or at least the new medicine, all's well qualifies to the extent to which modernity maintains this dedication. Is the coerced marriage of Helena and Bertrand really a marriage? We do not know, in fact, how the play ends. For the closing words between Helena and Bertrand are ambiguous. Helena, will you be mine? Now you are doubly one, Bertrand. If she, my liege, can make me know this clearly, I'll love her dearly, ever, ever dearly. Helena, if it appear not plain and prove untrue, deadly divorce step between me and you. Oh, my dear mother, do I see you living? The last words on the marriage between Bertrand and Helena are deadly divorce. How then does she make clear that she has fulfilled the requirements of the challenges? Oddly, she does not quote the letter Bertrand writes exactly, although she challenges him to prove it, it is untrue. Her original phrase is, show me a child, but his original phrase is, show me a child begotten of thy body that I am father to. And she supposedly reads the letter in Act 5 as saying, is by me with child. The recapitulation omits the important word father. The suggestion in the first statement might be that Bertrand must acknowledge a child as his. This would mean that he acknowledges its legitimacy. The second statement only requires a pregnancy induced by Bertrand. The final logic of the mandragula, followed through to all's well, is that the position of the father is obliterated. I do not believe that I'm able to see the bottom of this alteration. For example, how does a deceiver like Helen make it appear plain that she's pregnant with Bertrand's child? Does she want a kind of sweet revenge and for him to accept her marriage on the basis of a child by another man? I mean, that's not likely. It's possible. Once on the Machiavellian trail of deceit, it has many possible branches. Or does deceit not matter any longer? Has the Machiavellian male's sense of his will and his apprehension been so corrupted that he can no longer resist the claims of the female fortune embodied in Helena? If the family is defeated, the centra centralized state in the person of the king is trans tr triumphant. Bertrand does not address the statement about loving Helena ever dearly to her, but to the king. From the beginning, the king took the power of deciding who would love whom, who would marry whom. Who is the honored by whom? Bertrand alone in the court stood in his way. The play strictly ends with the king offering to Diana the price of her dowry and telling her to choose her husband. We do not know whether he means to command whomever she might choose to marry Diana as he did with Bertrand, if he intends to aid her in getting her choice by the weight of the crown. The play ends where it begins. Moreover, it's obvious that the apparent happy ending is best conditional. If my liege can make, if Helena, my liege, can make me know this clearly, I'll love her dearly, ever, ever dearly. This statement from a man who has just been shown that all he thinks he knows, he does not know at all. Therefore, we do not see the Bertrand and Helena story to its end. There is, strictly speaking, no ending, only a beginning. We still await, as we await in the Mandracula, the new life. If new life is the purpose of the scheme, then it might be appropriate for the play to end at its beginning. Modernity might be a project to rid humans of unattainable ends, such as the afterlife, and celebrate the free beginnings of new life. Medicine is an art of health, and health is desired for the quality of life. Helena's last line in the play is not to Bertrand. It's to his mother, the Countess. Oh, my dear mother, do I see you living? What a strange last line. Helena adopts entirely the argument that a mother does not need to be a natural mother. And why should Helena show surprise that the Countess still lives? The art of medicine is indeed concerned with life. Yet in the play, it is not primarily concerned with new life. We do not witness its use to bring the newborn into the world, but rather to keep the old born in the world, something I'm not objecting to. In the Mandragora, the whole scheme is put in the service of new life. 
The family is weakened, but not destroyed. Lucretia is perhaps crafty, but the men equal her in her craftiness. In all is well, the family seems destroyed. Exactly the reinvigorated Machiavellian male is used as an instrument to destroy the family. Shakespeare depicts an emasculated fatherhood. The new science allows a new kind of woman to prevail. She's not the center of the family, but the center of the state. The sovereign king decides who is to marry whom according to the inclination of the modern woman. Finally, Machiavellian virtue is defeated by a, by a kind of clever chastity that in effect permits the female will to prevail. It is her chastity that allows her to say who the father of her children is. And by the way, chastity is the main virtue of the new Atlantis. Fortune is overcome, but fortune is a male, and he is overcome by deception. Shakespeare displays the developments that Machiavellian medicine provide, the, I'm sorry, that Baconian medicine produces in a Machiavellian world. The Italian doctor of politics would find that neither the end justifies the means, nor all's well that ends well. For in, the, for in Bacon's redesign of Machiavelli's modernity, we moderns cannot say that all ends well, because for us, there are no ends. This is the second trick. <laughs>